and turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 7 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to show you a huge contradiction if you believe that the body of Christ goes into any part of the coming time of Jacob's trouble, also called the Great Tribulation by some people. But I'm going to show you a huge contradiction. The Lord showed me this the other day. I'm going to share it with you. Okay? And what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you the contradiction right up front. And then I'm going to go and get into the scriptures and actually read the scriptures. Because, see, I've learned over the years that post-tribbers have a very short attention span. And if you can't prove your point in five minutes or less, they skip off to something else and say, I couldn't even make it through the video or whatever else. So I try to keep it short for them. right? But then for the Bible-believing Christians, then I'll just kind of get in and fill in the scriptures and you'll stick with it till the end, I'm sure. But let me show you the contradiction. Okay? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 Verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, and then it goes on to talk about this son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast. Okay, it's the, just different titles for the same man. And if you get into verses uh, 6 down through 7, it talks about that there's something hindering the Antichrist from showing up. And I've talked about that in other studies. It's the body of Christ. All right, not going to get into that here. That's not the point of this to show this contradiction. Here's the point. There shall come a falling away first. There's a falling away. It's a doctrinal falling away. Some people try to make it the rapture. Well, the falling away actually means catching up. That's stupid. Well, we can mess with the Greek and stuff. You can mess with the Greek and prove all kinds of nonsense. All right. Falling away does not mean catching away or catching up or something like this. It doesn't mean that. Falling away, it's a great apostasy of falling away from sound biblical preaching and teaching. And I'm sure if you're a post-tribber, you would agree with that, that there's definitely this thing there, this falling away, a doctrinal falling away. And of course, there's a lot of other places which we're going to turn to here in just a minute or two. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4 also talk about in the end times, there's a falling away from the truth, a you know departure among professing Christians from the doctrinal purity. You know, that should be there as, as Christians. So there is no doubt that there is a apostasy from the truth in the end times. But now if you go to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, After this I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And it goes down through there, and it says that these people came out of great tribulation. So wait a second. Here's the contradiction. Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we have a great falling away. There won't be many people getting saved, in other words. It's a total destruction of, of sound biblical doctrine. It gets worse and worse and worse. And I'm going to show you supporting scriptures to, to prove that. Doctrine gets worse and worse and worse. So then how can Revelation chapter 7 say there's a great multitude that gets saved out of that time period? If there's no break, you see, if there is no church age, we just go, you know, Jesus is, you know, death, burial, resurrection, then the church is established in Acts chapter 2, and then it goes from there up until the second coming. If that's the case, then how do you go from great apostasy to now all of a sudden massive people, number of people getting saved? See, if you're a post-tribber, you have to see, you have to kind of ignore that there's something that happens there. If you're a pre-tribber, or you believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away of the body of Christ, like the Bible teaches, then you can realize, oh well, yeah, it's the church age ends, that there's this great apostasy, and very few people are actually even saved right now. Most people are false converts. And when the rapture happens, boom, you have genuinely saved going up, and all the other false converts stay right here on the earth, and they go, oh, okay, all the doctrinal disputes are over, no more reformed versus you know, Arminian and Calvinistic and, and this and, and, you know, the, the uh, baptism of the Holy Ghost versus, uh, it's all over, you see. The ones that were saved went up and the ones that were lost stayed down. So that would probably cause a, quite a revival, if you would. Apostasy and boom, rapture, body of Christ goes up and the rest of the people down here going, I don't think we made it. And now all of a sudden they're going to get very, very fervent those that don't hold the truth in you know, pleasure and unrighteousness, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
all of a sudden people are going to get really fervent for the things of the Lord. See? It doesn't work if you're post-trib. How do you get go from apostasy, doctrinal impurity, to all of a sudden lots and lots of people getting saved? Something has to happen. Now let's get back into the actual scriptures here. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Okay, it says here, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Again, I've talked about all this in other studies. I'm not going to get back into it. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. Okay, the son of perdition. So you see, there is definitely a falling away that happens. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, let's see what this falling away is. Again, you compare Scripture with Scripture as a Bible-believing Christian. If that was the only mention of a falling away, um, you know, then you wouldn't have much of an argument. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In the latter times, mm -hmm. there shall come a great falling away, or a falling away first. Excuse me, it doesn't say great falling away. Verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. A little side note there, by the way, brethren. Any kind of a diet, any kind of a system or whatever else that tells you that there are certain types of meat that you should not eat, it's of the devil. Plain and simple. It says, verse 4, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. It's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So something comes along and it tells you, well, you shouldn't eat this type of meat because it's bad for your body type or your blood type or your this or your that. Uh, that contradicts the scriptures. I'm going to stick with the Word of God. Thank you very much. I could care less how many PhDs or whatever, uh, doctor, so-and-so, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> I know what the book says. I want to stick with God's Word, not man's. All right, But again, you see it lines up with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. There's a falling away, not a spiritual revival. Now, you know, again, is Paul, has, it, has he somehow, is he lying? Because if what he is saying and what John are saying, they're two different things. What's going on there? Paul's saying, no, it's going to fall apart. John's saying, no, there's going to be a great multitude that gets saved. What do you do there? It's called right division. Dispensational teaching. Which we'll talk about as we continue. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 5, or 1 through 5, excuse me. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Are we in perilous times? Absolutely. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Paul, you're, you're confused. Paul, you know, up there in heaven. Paul, you don't know what you're talking about. There's going to be a great multitude that gets saved. Revelation chapter 7 proves it. How could you say having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof? How can you have people having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof when there's a great multitude that gets saved? And Revelation chapter 6 talks about them having their heads cut off. How is that going to happen? Paul's saying that's going to get worse and worse and worse in the body of Christ. John says, look at all this revival. Look at all these people getting saved. People willing to lose their heads for the, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. There's a problem there if you don't believe in the rapture. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. 
I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. See again, Paul does not understand. See, Paul's lying here, obviously not under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, because he's saying it's going to get worse and worse. The time's going to come. They're not even going to be able to endorse sound doctrine. They're going to be heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears. And of course, you know, you can read this and you can apply it to today and look at the world today and say, there's stuff that professing Christians are doing today that Christians have never done. I mean, you go, you go back to, to a Dark Ages Catholic, you know, five, six hundred years ago. You go back to a Catholic back then and say, show them some of the stuff that the modern Protestants are doing and they'd be, oh, they'd be shocked to death. They'd be like, What? You know, they're, they're doing this. They're bringing this into their church buildings. and so, It would shock a Catholic 500 years ago, you know? I mean, you know, it'd shock a Catholic even before uh, Vatican II, what some of the Protestants are doing today. It's disgusting. But you see, um, somehow magically it changes from what Paul's saying to now John saying that there's going to be this great number of people get saved. Let's look about that. Revelation chapter 7. Turn over there. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 14. Now, we're going to see apostasy here, okay? We're going to see it. The falling away, people don't want to endure sound doctrine, whatever else. Or maybe not. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Um, well, then there's a lot of people getting saved in this time period that's coming. Again, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth uh, seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. People are willing to die for this book. Don't tell me it's, all, oh, it's a reference to the original Hebrew and Greek. Uh, the original Hebrew and Greek don't exist. <laughs> you know? Some of these people. Um, what are they dying for? The Word of God? They aren't going to be dying for the Catholic versions, the NIV or the ESV or any, any of the other ones like that. Uh, those things are promoted by the Catholics. Who, what are they going to die for? This old book right here, King James Bible. It's already illegal in a lot of countries and things, and, and uh, it's going to be considered hate literature. You know, the sodomite agenda is being used as a you know, political weapon by the Vatican. And they're going to use it eventually to put people to death and things that don't go along with the Holy Church and the whole system, the Antichrist system. That's what they're going to do. So how do you have people falling away from the truth? The time will come when they will not endorse sound doctrine, but yet they're willing to die for the book. And there's no break there. What causes these people to become so fervent? Yeah, I really hate to say it, but uh, most Bible-believing Christians today, the ones that are genuinely saved, would not be willing to go and have their head cut off for this book. You'd make excuses. You'd find ways around it. I mean, if they ever pass laws or whatever else, well, you know, my goose is cooked. I'm all over the Internet, you know, over a thousand videos and things out there, over 1,300, I think, actually now all these videos and things that I've put out, I can't go hide and pretend at all. I never stood for the King James Bible. You know, I've already taken my stand. There's nothing I can do about it. But what about some of you out there? If it all of a sudden became illegal and you knew you were going to be going to prison within 48 hours, unless you started to kind of cover your tracks a bit, 
and you know that when you went to prison, they would take you out and publicly execute you, maybe locally, or maybe they'll just post it on TV, have these people's heads cut off. Are you that fervent? And, and believe me, don't, don't look at me and think, oh, you know, Brother Brian, he's got it figured out. Man, he'd be tough enough. That'd be scary. Here in the announcement, anybody that believes this King James Bible and that professes to believe in Jesus Christ and without, you know, membership in Christ's church, <laughs> Catholic church, uh, you're an enemy of the state. You will be executed as soon as we catch you. That'd be a little scary. That'd be very scary. So then what makes it transition from people who won't endure sound doctrine to now all of a sudden people willing to have their heads cut off for the Word of God? Something has to happen there. Because if it doesn't, if there's no break in that time period, if there's no break from apostasy, boom, fervency, if there's no break there, then Paul's a contradiction. Paul is a liar. And how is it that you have people in the time of Jacob's trouble, they can't take the mark of the beast? If they do, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11 says, any man that takes the mark gets God's wrath. Well, how does that work? Paul says that we're sealed until the day of redemption. Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 4 talks the same way. We're sealed. We have eternal security right now. They don't have eternal security in the future. What happens? There has to be a break. Something has to happen be between the two time periods. That thing is the rapture. The body of Christ goes up. So I don't see it. Can't help you. A lot of these people, you get some of these false you know, teachers and stuff out there, they will twist the scriptures and twist it and twist it and twist it and just make just some of the stuff that these people go to to, to get around the truth, um, it's devils that are helping them do it. I mean, there's just no nice way for me to say it. <laughs> you know. And if you're following them, you're, you're not saved. At one point in time, I'd have said, yeah, you know, I, I had some grace and stuff post-tribbers. I think there's some that are saved and they just they believe a little bit differently. I don't have that grace anymore. There's just so much that's come out. Um, and when you really look at the whole thing where they're trying to say what we have now is what's going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, they're calling God a liar. Um, Christians right now have eternal security. They don't have it in the time of Jacob's trouble. Christians right now are looking at this world and going, Ugh, you know, all we're doing, to use a military term, is a rear guard action. We're just trying to keep the enemy at bay. We're not going to be having revivals or some kind of massive end times movement or something like this. Paul says it's not going to happen. They're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Some shall depart from the faith. They're not going to endorse sound doctrine. There shall come a falling away first. All these different things. It's not going to get better during the church age. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. Now, I do believe that the small remnant of Bible-believing Christians that are there that do understand what's going on, I think that there's going to be, this is part of the refining of us as Bible-believing Christians, that we're going to see the errors and we're going to see things. And again, there's a lot of stuff that the Lord has helped me to bring out, a lot of stuff that some of the other brethren have brought out and said, hey, what do you think about this? And it kind of gets tossed back and forth between us and then the heretics will try to debunk it or whatever else. And it's like their arguments fall flat and you go, okay, maybe this is what we need to believe as Bible-believing Christians. Maybe these are the stands, you know. It's kind of like the council in uh, Acts chapter 15 where they're talking about, you know, what should be preached to the Gentiles. And they kind of toss it back and forth and they give different opinions and things. And finally they decide, okay, let's put no difference between us, the Jews, and, and the Gentiles, the uncircumcised. See, that still goes on among the body of Christ. Among the body of Christ, there will be times of debate with, and I don't mean debate like Romans chapter you know, 1 debate. I'm, I'm talking about you know, discussion, I should say it that way. That's a bit more of a biblical term there. You know, discussion among the body of Christ where we can say, hey, what do you think about whatever? Um, you know, whatever it is. And when you get that thing figured out, you say, okay, then this is where we're going to stand. You know, the body of Christ, way back in the 18th century, decided, 
uh, through many years of testing and proving that this King James Bible is God's book. And this book has been unchanged since 1769. Okay? Stick with it. It's worked for a long time. We don't need to go and revise it again. And well, we should, and now it's time that we look at it. No, no. It's been settled, firmly set. You know, William Tyndale came out with his New Testament translation, which is very, very similar to the King James Bible. I think over 95% similar. But uh, he came out with the thing, and, and it was like, okay, you know, but it didn't last, you know, very long. And it was like Coverdale came out with his, and then, you know, Matthews came out and stuff like that. And, and you know, different ones came out, and finally the King James Bible. Lord could have said, hey, King James Bible's good, but we're going to revise it, and we're going to this. And, and you notice, too, by the way, that when the Lord moved to the next one in the Texas Receptus line of, of Bible translations, he moved to the next one. The previous one just kind of faded away. And God said, I'm not using that one anymore. Some guy's saying, I'm going to stick with the Geneva Bible. The Lord says, okay, you go do your thing. We're going with the authorized version, known today as the King James Bible. See? Now, the body of Christ goes through these refining times. And I'll tell you right now, um, the arguments back and forth over the rapture issue, it, there's no longer any kind of argument. There's no longer any kind of grace that we need to have uh, as pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away believers. We don't need to have grace for the post-tribbers anymore. Um, they've proved themselves. They go into replacement theology, Roman Catholic doctrine. They say about the church needs to be purified, Roman Catholic doctrine. Um, they'll get into new versions, Roman Catholic doctrine. They start teaching works, Roman Catholic doctrine. They're proving themselves to be Catholics, proving themselves to be false converts. That's the whole thing. So this thing has been gone over and gone over and gone over. Uh, Lord's helped me to do, I think, over 120 different videos on the rapture issue. And I'm not the end all answer to everything, you know, but there's other brethren out there that put out some good stuff too, good arguments that I haven't even, you know, Lord hasn't showed to me. And it's just like I get a real blessing from watching their stuff. And uh, it's just like the body of Christ has shown. Uh, the Christians aren't going to be here when the Antichrist shows up. I mean, again, read Revelation chapter 5, the body of Christ is there. Revelation chapter 6, the Antichrist is revealed. First seal is open. And again, how can you have, how can you have Paul writing and saying, massive falling away from the truth, and John writes and says, great multitude which no man could number getting saved. And you know, we, I was talking about this with my wife and the other day, and I said, you know, you have, what, 7 billion people in the world. And uh, if you read the book of Revelation, you have approximately about, half or so of that population. One judgment alone is like a third of the people on the earth. But till you get to the whole way through it, most you know, commentaries I've ever read will say about half the world's population is going to get killed. Well, that would still leave. What would, what would happen if you had just one billion people get saved? You know, John over in Revelation chapter 5, he looks and he sees one, uh, basically a little over 100 million. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels, which I believe are redeemed Christians, because he sees the 24 elders, and then he mentions the angels next. And Jesus talked about in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are married, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And I'll show you something else here in Revelation 7 in just a minute. But you have, you know, he numbers them. Not, not exact. He just simply says, basically, 100 million and thousands of thousands. So John's there, he's able to number them, the body of Christ. And yet, in this time period that's coming, he says, it's a great multitude which no man could number. I mean, how are you going to count, do a head count of a billion people? But it wouldn't be far-fetched to say maybe a billion people could get saved in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a lot of people. But something has to happen for these people to become so radical that they'd be willing to die rather than take the mark. Something needs to occur. They're falling away right now. There's this great departure from truth. People are doing all kinds of things in churches being just totally wicked. Don't tell me that all of a sudden the Antichrist is going to show up and those people are going to say, I'm willing to die for Jesus Christ. I'm just willing to die. They wouldn't do it if their lives depended on it. What is it that has to happen? 
You'd have all the denominations and all the other things just fighting right on to in through the time of Jacob's trouble. So what is it that happens? It's the rapture. The rapture is that shift that happens where all of a sudden you have lukewarm, excuse me, lukewarm people that are not willing to, to even get yelled at for Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden they're so fervent that they're willing to die for Jesus Christ. The rapture is what happens. Let me show you one other thing here before we quit. Revelation chapter 7. Check this out. Here you have uh, verse 9, well, verses um, 4 down through verse 8. You have the 144,000 Jews that are sealed. Again, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says you know, that there's neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ Jesus. But here it's saying Jews and then Gentiles underneath that. They're separated. Why? Because you're not dealing with Christians. You're not dealing with people that are in Christ. That's why they have to be careful not to take the mark. They have to endure to the end to be saved. Revelation 14, verse 12 says about they have to keep the faith or yeah, keep have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments. You know, um, dealing with some a different time period here. But notice this. Verse 9. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels, Christians, now are we the sons of God? The sons of God in the Old Testament reference always to angels. Hmm. And all the angels stood around, around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts mixed in with the elders, 24 elders very clearly uh, Christians. Revelation chapter 5 talks about that. And fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. Okay? They're all fallen down before God, worshipping Him. Saying, Amen, blessing and glory and, and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Okay? So you get the angels and the 24 elders, they're there worshipping before the throne. But the other group, the 144,000 Jews and the great multitude that no man could number, they're a separate group. Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes. Such an important thing to get there. And made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They wash their own robes and they make them white in the blood of the Lamb. Works. There's faith involved. Sure, absolutely. Turn to Revelation 14, verse 12. I'm just going to show you that verse if you've not seen it before. Here's the patience of the saints. Here, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Two things there. What's the commandments of God? Don't tell me that they can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly without ever breaking them or whatever. No, I don't believe that. No one's ever been able to except for Jesus Christ. But uh, what's the commandments of God in that time of Jacob's trouble? Don't take the mark. You can't take the mark. That's a commandment. All right? They have to keep that commandment. They have to endure to the end. With, with what? You can't have a job for seven years. You can't have a bank account for seven years. You can't have a driver's license for seven years. You can't go to the grocery store and buy food. You can't pay your electric bill. You can't pay your mortgage rent or your mortgage or your rent or whatever. You can't get a gun, buy a gun, or, or you can't... You see what I'm saying? No identification. No ability to buy or sell. Um, you say, why not? Because God makes a commandment in that time period. Don't take the mark. Read Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. That's the commandments of God. And of course, the Sabbath day does come back there too, which is interesting because that's something, the way that God deals with Israel. Not with Christians. But... Uh, they wash their robes and make them, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. All right? A Christian today is washed. I'm washed. I don't have to go and wash my robes and whatever else. I don't need to do that. So, you know, we can keep going on and on and on, but the whole point is of this video, another huge contradiction where you have the body of Christ getting worse and worse and worse, and all of a sudden the time of Jacob's trouble 
they're getting better. Now, if there's no break there, if there's no rapture, then Paul's a liar. Paul said it gets worse. John says, no, actually it gets better. There's a break. The rapture. The only question is, are you going to be going up? Are you saved? You better get that thing worked out today. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.